Today on Larry King Now, our tribute to iconic filmmaker Wes Craven. Wes, a lot of people try to follow the trend. You know, there'll, there'll be a successful haunted house movie and they'll come out with a haunted house movie. But what Wes did was he, he did things that scared him. And I think that's the key when you're making a scary movie. He was totally brilliant and a real intellectual um, and a very decent, wonderful person. And um, I really, I'm really forever grateful to him. On his legacy. He reinvented the genre several times. He began with those gritty, nasty, hardcore films. Uh, you know, A Last House on the Left and The Hills Have Eyes. And then he did the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise which exploited surrealism and the imagination and the dreamscape, the landscape of the nightmare. And then he reinvented again with screen fantasies. And you know, had West not passed, I'm sure he would have probably come up with some hooks for the new reinvented scream on television. So he literally reinvented horror three times in my lifetime. On the man behind the camera, is he the same offset as on? Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's what speaks to how nice of a man he was, is there was no difference between how he was with you on set or off or at his house or whatever. Plus, you know, personally, and I think for those who worked with him, he brought a grace to things that, you know, sometimes is lacking on film sets. And, you know, he's the leader of a crew of, you know, 150 people and sets the tone, and it's always a pleasure to show up at work for him. And he enjoys scaring us. He loves scaring us. It's all next on Larry King Now. <music> Welcome to a special edition of Larry King Now. On August 30th of this year, the world lost one of its most iconic filmmakers, Wes Craven was known by generations of horror fans for films such as The Hills Have Eyes, The Last House on the Left, The People Under the Stairs, and of course, A Nightmare on Elm Street and Scream. I recently spoke with some of the famous people who either acted in his films or were inspired by him. As part of our Wes Craven tribute, we welcome Skeet Ulrich. Jamie Kennedy, who appeared in two screams, got killed in the second one, right? Mm -hmm. Robert Englund is with us, who played Freddy Krueger, the infamous serial killer. Ulrich starred as one of two high school uh, age killers in Scream, the 1996 slasher film written by Kevin Williamson, directed by Wes. What was it like to uh, first audition for Wes? Uh, well, he's such a welcoming person, you know, he was so nice and you could just feel the support from him from the time you walked into the room. I mean, and that that's how he was from that moment until, you know, uh, he parted, just a, a great human being. I remember I had pink hair because I had done Romeo and Juliet, which was my <laughs> first movie. So I had a third call back from Mexico City and um, I had pink hair and he's like, what happened to your hair? <laughs> and I'm like, I got a another movie, and then I thought, I lost this part. You're not gonna get it. No way, and then, sure enough, he saw past the hair. Well, you know, it was a traditional Hollywood audition, but uh, I was younger then, and I had more hair, and uh, I remember sitting in the parking lot before I went into the office, and saying, you know, I look too healthy for this part. I had long blonde hair then, and I was very tan, and I, took a, a cigarette butt out of the ashtray in my car and I moistened it with saliva and I put circles under my eyes. And then I took the dipstick uh, out from under the hood of the car and I put a little bit of grease on my hands and slicked my hair back. And I have thin, fine hair, so I looked balder and it also recessed my hairline. And that's how I went into the office and I played staring games with Wes. I Did think you get it right there? I think that's what did it. I kept my mouth zipped shut. Did you like his work before? Yeah, the, actually I was thinking about this. The first VHS my family ever rented was Nightmare on Elm Street, which is a little telling about my family. I'd seen uh, the Nightmare on the Elm Street series <laughs> and I was shooting a movie, one of the first films I made in Baltimore and went with John C. Riley, amongst others in our cast to see the new Nightmare 
which a riot broke out in the theater, so I'll never forget seeing that one. What made Nightmare on Elm Street so successful? Boy, I'd love to take credit. I think, well, you Wes, get a lot of credit. I think Wes would love to take credit, but and, and, and he should, but you know, it's really the great hook that Wes knew was universal, which is the bad dream that somebody can enter into your dream and manipulate you, that they can take advantage of your own private secrets, your fears, uh, your, your, your private knowledge and exploit that and use it against you. Freddy haunted your nightmares. That's something that was like, that's the one place you get a little, you know, peace. And if you can't get peace there, then. What was it like to be directed by Wes Craven? Uh, he's, you know, he's has such a psychological bent to him. And so he was always sort of probing deeper and looking for the motives behind things and, and asking more of you and uh, but at the same time it was done with such a gentleness and, and he really respected his actors and, and admired them. For me Wes was uh, he was like a, he was a kind of a gentleman. You, we, we, he was a double threat Larry. He was a writer and a director so if we had trouble with a scene he could fix the writing as well as restaging it. Uh, but he left me alone. Uh, I worked in oh, really? Yeah, I did a television series with Wes. Uh, I did three movies with Wes, and he left me alone, which I liked. I liked that respect. Think about it, he makes these wild movies, right? You know, very scary, but off camera, he's a very relaxed person, well read. We got you know, it. you're doing this grotesque scene in blood and blood, and he'd be just. Very calm, very calm, very peaceful, and he feels like he's very confident in his ability, so he feels that he gets it. He got it, and you can move on. And I'll never forget this. I'm like, we're, we're making a horror movie. And he's like, shouldn't it be crazier? And he's like, just because we're making a horror movie doesn't mean it has to be horrific. Why do you think he liked horror so much? I, I think he liked that sort of dark side. Well, I think Wes's great gift was that he managed to keep the 14-year-old adolescent fanboy alive in him. Wes, you know, didn't see movies. He was forbidden to see films by his parents uh, uh, when he was a child, with the exception of Disney films. You know, he was, my understanding was he was raised not being allowed to watch TV, not being allowed to see movies, and uh, I, I think it really spoke to a part of him that was squashed early on, you know, that that sort of fear in people and, and you know, it's fun to, to, it's one of the biggest reactions you can get in a theater is in horror films. I think Wes kept that, that young, wide-eyed boy alive inside him. We'll be right back with our Wes Craven tribute. I just flowed into an old Wes, you know, that was a lot of fun to do and uh, wasn't worried about offending people. and. And at the same time, I had this wonderful script, um, which could never be discounted. You know, it had been something that Kevin had written years previously and had worked on a lot, and it just was a, a well-oiled machine. So there was virtually nothing that needed to be done to it. And uh, it's one of those cases when you have the script and you have the stars and you have the support from the studio that isn't afraid to spend money, then you can really do something special. Did you think Scream would be the hit it was? <laughs> I remember reading it. I remember thinking this script is really good. It was all dialogue, nothing, no fat. When we were making it, we thought if we can have a movie that comes out in this new DVD format and you know makes its 15 million back at the box office, we're good. I thought people would like it. Did I think it was going to be the pop culture icon? No way. Uh, most of us were quite unknown at that time, and, and horror was dead at that time. And yeah, it was. Yeah, so I, I don't think we had any idea of what it would become. And I have 14-year-old twins, and like their friends are now big fans of the movie, so it spanned generations. Did you know when you were shooting it that that movie would take off? <laughs> I don't think any of us did. I don't think Wes did. I, I, I suspect that even the, the, the people that Bob Shea and the people at New Line Cinema didn't realize it either. We, we knew we'd done something unique, and we were proud of it. Uh, but, you know, we ran out of money two-thirds of the way through. I think we were just grateful to get it finished and, and hoped that maybe it would find an audience. You think he was satirizing his own films? Oh, in Scream? Yeah. Uh, 
I think he was telling you that he was aware of his films, but I think he was evolving with the times. And as a children of that era, we saw what was happening, and we were getting too smart not to realize that these things could happen. And it was like meta, if you will. I mean, it had some genuine fears in it, and also, you know, it, you know, other than Columbine and its reality, you know, it it, it had this sort of documentary feel to it with youth and the serial killers in it. Um, and that's how I approached it. I was, you know, in my mind, I was making a documentary about these teenage serial killers. And You know, with all the things that have happened since, yeah. he was ahead of his time, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, it's scary. You think horror is appreciated as a genre? I, I Yeah, I think it is. I mean, I think, you know, it's, uh, you know, it may not be at the Academy, but I think, you know, audiences in particular really respond to it and... Uh, obviously, this time of year, it's bigger than ever. But yeah, I think it has a has a great following to it. What has Wes Craven's impact on the genre been? Uh, he's, he's on the Mount Rushmore. Is he number one? He's, I mean, he has to be up there, right? I mean, it's him. You think of him. He just the name Wes Craven. I mean, he's definitely <laughs> on the Mount Rushmore. You've got John Carpenter. Yeah. You know, um, even Toby hasn't done as much lately, but the first Texas Chainsaw is just fantastic. Um, so I would say he's up there. I mean, I kind of think of him as number one. You could throw Clive Barker, but I don't know. His impact has been enormous, though. Yeah, he's he's massive. I mean, I hate to have to say that it's horror because it's, it's just a great movie. But, yeah. you know, the people put it in the genre, but it is more. When they discuss the history of horror movies... Where will Wes Craven's name be? Well, you know, Larry, he reinvented the genre several times. He began with those gritty, nasty, hardcore films, uh, you know, A Last House on the Left and The Hills Have Eyes. And then he did the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, which exploited surrealism and the imagination and the dreamscape, the landscape of the nightmare. And then he reinvented again with the scream fantasies. And, you know, had West not passed, I'm sure he would have probably come up with some hooks for the new reinvented Scream on television. So he literally reinvented horror three times in my lifetime. What's Wes Craven's legacy? Well, I think in terms of the business, he redefined horror many times over. Um, you know, People Under the Stairs, I think, is, it's a great film. It was really, you know, powerful to me early on. But I think he continued to redefine the genre. And, uh, you know, personally, and I think for those who worked with him, he brought a grace to things that, you know, sometimes is lacking on film sets. And... You know, he's the leader of a crew of, you know, 150 people and sets the tone. And it's always a pleasure to show up at work for him. And he enjoys scaring us. He loved scaring us. How'd you find out Wes died? I was in London with one of the actors from the film. Uh, I was over there doing a film festival. And uh, it just uh, yanked the rug out from under me, Larry. I, I, we thought he had problems with a broken leg. You know, you get older, you break a hip or a leg or a foot, and you gotta really do your rehab. You really gotta pay attention to that. And that's what we all thought. We all thought Wes was uh, rehabbing a broken leg and it had taken a, a while to heal. I had no idea that uh, he was that ill. He kept it from everyone, I believe. More of our special Wes Craven tribute episode after this. What was it like being Freddy? You know, it was real liberating actually, oh. because I'd been doing the television show, which is very behavioral. A lot of TV acting and a lot of film acting, there's a little voice in your head going, don't act. Whatever you do, don't act. And underneath all that latex and all of that colostomy bag, medical <laughs> adhesive glue, uh, I was able to play. I was able to move differently and change my voice and use tricks I'd learned when I was a theater actor. So in a way, it was very liberating for me. After I finished the Freddy franchise, I think it really improved my acting. Playing a villain, mm. is that more fun? Uh, it, in that instance, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a, a, quite a challenge to it because you, you want, especially in Scream, you know, I wanted the audience to to like this guy and to feel his innocence and to really feel like it was just a kid in love. 
you know, and uh, so there's layers to it that were really interesting and fun. And I was 26 at the time, you know, playing a 17 year old kid. So the, you know, getting back into that mind frame was really interesting. You think West, in a sense, sometimes was almost satirizing. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, the entire time. Is acting acting or is horror different? I think for me, in, in terms of horror acting, I was allowed to be more liberated, as I said earlier. But I think for a lot of actors, you actually have to dig deep and become actually hyper real because so much around you is fantasy. And many times when you see the, the, the stars, the leading men and women in, in horror films or, or uh, big action special effects movies, they're not working with any of the things that we see in the movie theater. They're working against a green screen. So they really have to double down and use their imagination and really focus. What was it like shooting it? Well, uh, again, it was very peaceful. So my first movie was Romeo and Juliet. It was in Mexico City. It was a wild movie. And it was 15, 16 hour days, crazy stuff. And then we go to Santa Rosa, California, which is wine country, and we start work at nine, and we've been done like at 5.30. And I'm like, <laughs> co-star is Courtney Cox, who's so just you know, blowing up on Friends, and I'm like, what do we do? And Wes is like, oh, let's have a wine dinner. Was he the same offset as on? Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's what speaks to how nice of a man he was, is there was no difference between how he was with you on set or off or at his house or whatever. How did he kill you off? <laughs> Larry, you didn't see it? Um, I forget. I, <laughs> I um, died in front of a van, a gruesome death. Throat was slashed. And when I died, so did my paycheck. That was a joke, Larry. How did Freddie change over the years? Did he? Yeah, you know, the, the, the fans out there really embraced his uh, sort of dark court jester sense of humor. And uh, I'll be honest, we exploited that. I think we jumped the shark along about Nightmare on Elm Street Part 6. Uh, but we did it intentionally. We, we, we kind of made a, a Warner Brothers cartoon out of that film. And uh, we, the audience had always responded to Freddie's wicked, nasty, politically incorrect sense of humor. So we, we, we kind of pushed that. When you took the makeup off and walked down the street, no one knew you were Freddy Krueger, did they? I was fortunate. Uh, I, I, I was established in Hollywood in the 70s as a character actor in feature films. And then I had a couple of hit TV shows. But when I got done with Freddy, I didn't look the same. So my anonymity was a combination of A, having been in the makeup for not only Freddy, but other horror movies like Phantom of the Opera, Stephen King's The Mangler. But also, I came out of that makeup in 95 uh, and then again in 2004, finally, and I was an older man. I wasn't the kid that went under the knife. <laughs> did you stay in touch with Wes? I did another film with Wes a few years after that, and um, we stayed in touch. You know, I got to know quite a bit about him. Um, I went to his memorial right after he passed and learned a lot more about him than I knew. Uh, it was quite touching. Did you keep in touch with him? Um, yeah, I did. I saw him a lot when we were filming, and then I saw him, you know, in, throughout the years. Um, and then I saw him at Scream uh, 4. Uh, and then we exchanged emails once in a while, but I hadn't seen him as much as I did. But How'd you learn of his death? Uh, I'm, someone called me, and, um, you know, Dot, uh, Jerry O'Connell, actually. How'd you learn of his death? I, you know, uh, somebody called me and, and told me, and I had... I had not seen Nev Campbell for years, like 18 years, and we had started doing some horror conventions together and stuff, and we were just talking about him, like, a few days before that happened, and we had, it was not long after his birthday, and we had made a birthday card for him and sent him pictures and didn't hear back, and we were kind of puzzled by that, and uh, so somebody called me and told me, and... Thanks, uh, Keith. Thank Great you pleasure much. having you with us. Nice to be with you. Thank, Thank you, man. man. Appreciate you. Jamie Kennedy. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Larry. Great meeting you. Thank you. Thanks, Freddie. <laughs> More from our Wes Craven tribute after this. You know, most of my career has been spent scaring people. But there is just a, there's a sense of, um, of pleasure to know that you've gotten to that place 
where people don't like to talk about, but have done it in a way that hasn't hasn't bruised them so much as uh, allowed them somehow to come out of the film happy, and that's the majority experience coming out of a, a good scary film, is the audience is bubbling. Something has been released in a way that scared the, the, the bejesus out of them, but also lifted something off them. And uh, Scream did that. It was intriguing, it was intelligent, it made you think. Most of the people could not guess who the killer or killers was or were, and uh, the performances were great. What, what did he mean to you as a kid growing up? You know, Wes Craven was one of those names that as you got older, his films grew with you. So when I was a kid, it was before VCRs. So films like Last House on the Left was the, was the film that your friend's older brother saw. So you'd have them going, oh, that's a movie. And they take the girl and they're pulling her entrails out. And I remember when I finally saw it, it actually lived up to the descriptions. It was so disturbing. Um, but Nightmare on Elm Street was a film that traumatized me. I remember I, I saw it on a VCR and I had to pause it and I think we played Clue for like six hours just to like cleanse ourselves of Elm Street and then I had to finish it during the day. I was actually too scared to watch the movie. Um, and then in the 90s, Scream brought back horror. So to, just to think of someone who has not only just had three massive influential horror films, but in three different decades, it's, it's insane. Um, when I made my first film, Cabin Fever, I made it for a very low budget, and I didn't have money for music, like to put songs. So I said, oh, I want Van Halen. They're like, sure, that'll be $300,000. And you're like, okay, I have $1,500 for six songs. And I went to a screening of Last House on the Left, and it has this kind of Harry Nilsson folky music done by David Alexander Hess. And I remember thinking like, God, this is 1972 and this is 2002. You couldn't use this music in a movie today. And I thought, that's it, I'm, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna track down that music. And so I took six songs from Last House on the Left, and I got the guy who plays the killer who sings these songs. It was his kids did a cover for the end credits. It was something super, super geeky. <laughs> and at the very first screening, Quentin Tarantino came, and he, saw, he heard the Last House on the Left music and was like, oh my God, this guy's the real deal. And I met Wes, and I was like, uh, hi, nice to meet you. Sorry, I stole six songs from your movie. <laughs> and he, was, he couldn't have been sweeter about it. What was your American debut? Scream 3, can you believe it? I was in Scream 3, and I will always uh, count Wes film. Craven, who sadly just... Uh, he was a great... I knew Wes. He was a wonderful guy, and he was one of my real first patrons and mentors, and he cast me in, in the completely unlikely part of a very ambitious actress from Bakersfield um, in, in Scream 3, and... Did you get to be killed? I got to be killed. The wonderful thing about those screen films is, films is the way they did it was no one knew whether they were the murderer or not because you didn't know the end of the story, which was brilliant because we all behaved like we were the murderer because we all, in our vanity, assumed that we were. So I think that was how he did it, how he created this sort of sort of weird suspense. He was brilliant at that. He was totally brilliant mm. and a real intellectual um, and a very decent, wonderful person. And um, I really, I'm really forever grateful to him. He really took an interest in me and did lots of wonderful things to encourage my career early on. And I, I, I love Wes. What did he do that others didn't do? What was his talent? You know, Wes, a lot of people try to follow the trend. You know, there'll, there'll be a successful Haunted House movie and they'll come out with a Haunted House movie. But what Wes did was he, he did things that scared him. And I think that's the key when you're making a scary movie. You know, Wes scared talked about, him. yeah, things that are your personal fears, your personal obsessions. And when he was making Last House on the Left, he, I, you know, I asked him and read interviews with him and he talked about the reaction he felt to seeing Vietnam footage on television and seeing those bodies and what that did to him and the fact that he wasn't allowed to see a movie until he was in college. And you know, when he even after he made the film, he was like, why did I make this movie? And then Nightmare on Elm Street, just that that fear that something is gonna, there's a serial killer that's gonna get you in your sleep. It's like what everyone else was doing, Michael Myers and Freddy Krueger trying to do, okay, this killer was crossed and now they're gonna get revenge on the kids. He's thinking, you know, what if that was actually in your sleep? Final thought. As you heard on this show, Wes was an innovator who reinvented the horror genre multiple times over his life, a life that ended far too quickly. But as is the case when any true artist passes, we have the benefit of remembering them through their work. And Wes Craven's art is the sort that has and will remain timeless. In the handful of times that I interviewed Wes, he was always exuded a kindness and humility that is often scarce in Hollywood, 
and that's the paramount reason for which he will be missed by those who knew him. My thanks to all my guests for joining us on this special episode. Happy Halloween. See you all next time.